34 has now finally arrived. From knockouts to tap outs. Inside the Octagon and beyond. Is this not real now? Are we pretending? We're rich, baby. Break out the red panties. This is the MMA Report with John Pollock. Unbelievable! Here we go! Hello and welcome to another edition of the MMA Report. I'm John Pollock. Thank you for tuning in here on FightNetwork.com. Whether you subscribe on iTunes... We appreciate the download and listening to the show. Coming up on today's show, uh, more of my chat with Misha Serkinov, who is getting set to return this Sunday. It's a Sunday morning card from the UFC as he will be taking on Volkan Uzdemir in light heavyweight action. It's an interesting card coming up this uh, this Sunday. Even I'm going to screw that up uh, because we've got the top two fights that are essentially this, I guess you can call it, little mini tournament, whoever looks best could end up fighting Jimmy Manoa at the end of July and becomes the on the same card as the Daniel Cormier John Jones rematch that is set for Anaheim, California at UFC 214. We're going to chat more with Misha Serkinov. Cody Saftik is going to be joining us from the Fight Network for his usual segment where we are going to go through all of the major news from the past week. We're going to touch on Bellator 179. We're going to discuss the UFC athletes retreat from Las Vegas. Some interesting notes coming out of that weekend. As well, we will talk tough and the best fight of the season thus far, which went down on Wednesday night. Plus, we will get Cody's rundown of what went on involving CM Punk and some guy named Johnny Bananas. And also want to make note here off the top that this week marks the 10th anniversary of two huge milestones, I feel, in mixed martial arts history. The number one being it was in May of 2007, May 21st to be exact, uh, that me and Mauro Ronaldo launched a program called Fight Network Radio. That was already 10 years ago that we launched this on Sirius Satellite Radio. It was Hardcore Sports Radio Channel 186, and then they moved I want to say to Channel 93, maybe. Someone's going to correct me on that. Uh, But this was uh, such a fun show to do, and I've talked about it every so often on this show because I almost look at the MMA report as kind of this weird extension of Fight Network Radio, which it was a daily show uh, with Moro and myself. I was more in the the producer role at the time, but did make my, uh, my appearances. And it was covering the worlds of boxing, mixed martial arts, and professional wrestling. And doing a daily show... Uh, like that, I look back now, and it was it was quite the time period because you had this. We were in the midst of the incredible growth of the UFC that had really taken foot in 2005, but I think was still growing significantly in 2007. And that's the other 10 year anniversary this week because that weekend after we launched was UFC 71, where Quentin Jackson defeated Chuck Liddell to become the UFC light heavyweight champion. That was 10 years ago this week. It's incredible. But anyway, getting back to the show, we launched the show on a Monday, which was Victoria Day here in Canada. And we had been promoting this date for weeks and weeks, May 21st, May 21st. And then on the Friday or Saturday, Hardcore Sports Radio contacts me and states, yeah, it's Victoria Day here on on Monday. No one's going to be here. So we're going to have to start the show Tuesday. And I'm thinking we've been promoting this date forever. Like what idiots we're going to look like if we've been promoting this and we have no show on Monday. So we we went back and we were able to work it out so that we could do this show. There would be one operator there for us, which was fine. That's all we needed. And we had Chris Lieben on our first show and we had Loretta Hunt, uh, who was at that time working for the Fight Network and – uh, later, of course, working with SI, SureDog, many outlets. Uh, so that was our first show. We did it on Victoria Day. It nearly didn't happen. And then uh, from there, it was, I mean, we we had always made kind of a, our holy trinity of guests that we, we aimed to get. We had Vince McMahon, who we never got. We had Dana White, who I believe we did get, and Don King. And Don King, we definitely got. And it was the best interview ever because Morrow asked, and Morrow, believe me, he could rattle off a million questions. 
He asked, I want to say, at most three questions during this 23-minute interview with Don King. It was just something else. And every day, it was just a different – it was different subject matter. You didn't know what direction the show would go in because we could dive deep into pro wrestling, into mixed martial arts, into boxing and find all these captivating individuals. And that was always something so fun. And uh, Moro, I always gave him – this credit that, I mean, he could flip on a dime and be ready. I mean, when you're doing a live show every day, you're going to run into problems where a guest isn't picking up the phone. They're not ready. Um, th- th- there's just, uh, boom, you have nothing. And the way the show was structured, it was 60 minute show, but it only had one break in the middle. So it was 22 and a half minutes for the first half, solid, no commercials, and then the second half, 22 and a half minutes. So if a guest wasn't there, it was on the host to fill, and both Moro and I found ourselves in that situation where, okay, we're five minutes into the show. We'd always do a news of the week or news of the day off the top, and then after that, that still left you with like 17 minutes, and there were days when you had to fill 17 minutes talking like I'm doing right now. And I'll tell you, it was the greatest education for myself to not only watch this, but then I found myself in that situation some days when I had to fill in for him and I had to do a filibuster for 18 minutes talking about anything, what was going on and and getting content out of it. But there were also times when a guest would fall out and boom, just text someone, hey, can you pop on quick? And Moral would get a 10 second note of, hey, X isn't available. I've got Y. He'll be ready to go in 30 seconds. And boom, Moro would crank out 20 minutes with the new guest. No prep. And that was the fun part of the show. It was chaotic at the time. We had to do it every day. But it was, uh, I think, some of the best education I got. I would put that um, at equal – I would put it above my formal education of when I went and and did a radio and television uh, program at Ryerson University. I did that for four years. Uh, but I will say uh, going, working at the Fight Network and working, doing that specific show for the two and a half years that I did it, I mean, that to me is where I, I feel I, I gain the most. So I want to make mention of that. None of you may have heard the show. It was a long era ago. Um, pre, I, uh, we weren't even on iTunes at that time in 2007. It's crazy. Maybe a show before it's time. Uh, but one that since that time, uh, people in the industry have come up, they've complimented me on that they used to listen to it. And, and that's always neat. It was a very fun part of my career. And it was 10 years ago, uh, that we launched that show. So there you have it. That is a, a nice little story to start things off for this week's show. And, up next, we're going to hear from Cody Safdick, part two with Misha Serkinov coming your way, and I'll take a quick look at Sunday's UFC card from Sweden. It's the MMA Report, and right now we're going to hear from CM Punk and Johnny Bananas. I fought, I lost, I lived to fight another day. You're the first guy in history to go and lose, and you're happy about it. I wouldn't brag about that. What do you do for a living? I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't go to the UFC and get my ass whooped. That's what I don't do. I was either going to win gloriously or die a glorious death. And that's something somebody like you is never going to understand. Because they wouldn't let you win because nobody would pay a dime to see your ass. That's why. I get it. That's your persona. And it's gotten you nowhere in life. So just keep it up, dude. Yeah, I you know. You're trying to make it in wrestling. You got your ass handed to you in the MMA. And now you're trying to make it this. You're a fan, brother. I get it. That's your say? persona. And it's gotten you nowhere in life. Yeah, I know. You're make it in wrestling. You got your ass handed to you in the MMA. And now you're trying to make it this. I'm a little disappointed in myself. I think bananas, he pushes buttons. He goes for the lowest hanging fruit. It is what it is. We're not neighbors. We're never going to be friends. I'm pretty sure that's why we're competitors. The guy obviously is trying to live up to the name that he's given himself, CM Punk. The guy needs to change it to CM Bitch because that's all that he does. All right, we're back here on the MMA Report as usual. Joining us here, Fight Network's Cody Safdick to go through 
some of the big topics of the week. What's going down, Cody? Yeah, coming off a good week as far as I'm concerned. The Bellator card was pretty good. The Invicta card was pretty good. The Titan FC card was so-so. So, uh, yeah, heading into this, uh, reality television front's been pretty good. The Ultimate Fighters, the, the fights themselves have been pretty good. And CM Punk picking up the big win in the Well, challenge. that's where I want to start because we just played the clip coming in here. And you are our cha- the challenge reporter here. Uh, tell us what went down between CM Punk and Johnny Bananas. Because I've never heard of this guy, Johnny Bananas. I've not watched the show. I'm not currently watching it. What exactly went down? Because this clip has gotten a lot of attention. Yeah, so basically what it is is uh, for the challenge, you have to nominate a team captain. And then if you're, if you're nominated as the team captain and your team wins, you get $5,000 towards your charity of your choice. Mm-hmm. So he's obviously he's got this like whatever it is, it's, a, it's basically like dog shelters in the Chicago. Chicago area. Yes. So good charity. That's what he's competing for. If your team loses the challenge and you were nominated as your team captain, you automatically get thrown into the challenge. So they go out against uh, the you know the seasoned pros of the challenge and they end up losing in in the challenge, which is you completely like wrap yourself up in like cellophane like saran wrap and then you have to like roll through like ketchup and mustard and relish and through oh, that's this whole... what all that crap was on Punk's yeah face. it's this whole obstacle course and then you get to the end and it's like time based so how quick can your team get to the end so he ends up losing so he automatically gets sent in and then through that they just start exchanging words him and Johnny Bananas Johnny Bananas gets in his face for someone who's good on the microphone in CM Punk I mean Johnny Bananas just the reality TV star he holds his own it's a good little exchange but in doing so he gets thrown in what I thought was much more interesting is this Sean Merriman, right? He's a former yeah. NFL standout. I just know him as a former NFL standout, former pro bowler, someone who is uh, regarded as one of the better players in the league, for defensive players in the league for a little bit of time anyways before injuries, I think, piled up on him. But apparently he's got beef with CM Punk dating back to like 2014 where they were in this like show, house show in like Spain. Yeah. And apparently he got turned down by the divas and CM Punk tweeted about it. So he goes up to him in the show and he's just like, bro, like, you know, uh, I, I, I was rubbed the wrong way about that. CM Punk's like, dude, like, I don't even give a crap. Like, I, you know, sorry, whatever. I, I don't care. Like, if you care, you care, whatever. And the guy's like, no, no, we're good. We're good. And there's might be like a tad bit of resentment or like the littlest bit of resentment. So now after CM Punk's team has lost now, he's now has to go into the challenge. His team has to vote on the other male member who's going to take on CM Punk in the challenge. So the one girl's just like, yeah, well, I think, you know, Sean probably did the, the poorest in the challenge. So I'm just going to put him in. And then someone else like, got challenged. And then it comes to him and he's just like, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's do this. So they end up basically get they get blindfolded and you get a sword, like a fake sword. It's like a stick, essentially. And if you hit the guy and the stick breaks, you get a point. First one to two points. He goes down 0-1. And this is probably the biggest takeaway I take from it, right? You get to call out someone on your team. I know this might sound a little bit confusing. Very simple, though. You just get to call someone from your team. You get blindfolded. To, to corner you and they're essentially your eyes for this challenge and you have to find the target hit the guy break the stick at the point so he gets himself a, a corner essentially a cornerman Merriman gets a cornerman and then they're going over like uh, their game plan right away like uh, before it starts and he looks at his cornerman and he goes my natural instinct is just to go straight crazy in there I was like no man this is what you did in your fight against Mickey Gall is just run blindly out there right. and it did not work well man you need to stop going with your natural instinct so he does like a front roll like a jiu jitsu front roll like a ninja roll and quickly goes down 0-1 John decides to calm down a little bit and is able to put a better game plan together and uh, and go so up. So there's so. lessons he can take out of the challenge for fight application. Yeah, just stay calm. Remain calm your opponent. If your opponent's inexperienced and they're going to that's the biggest transition I think when you look at amateur mixed martial arts compared to professional martial mixed martial arts is that amateurs they could just go out there wild, they go out there aggressive. They don't know what they're doing. They're tense. Professionals, there's more of like a pace. There's more of a you know a thought process. There's more of a feeling out process. Getting to know your opponent and cho- choosing choosing your selection wisely and what you're actually going to do in there. Whereas you know he, once he goes down zero and one against Sean Merriman, he realizes like okay, you know what, I'm just going to think this one through and realize if I can just get close enough to him and duck, then this guy who's blindfolded is swinging wildly. I can just go at the legs, and that proved to be the winning strategy. So he got something like thirty because there's a challenge like fantasy league as well. So we got thirty points for winning the challenge as well he got uh 10 points for his physical or not physical but his confrontation with johnny bananas which is drama points so he's scoring pretty good he was a nine dollar value play to start the year john so he's uh he's doing quite well well could you as we move on from our challenge report (laughs) uh speaking about bellator could you not help but think about cm punk when you were watching kevin ferguson jr of taking somebody that has minimal experience. This guy had one pro fight before this fight on this past Saturday in London, and he's fighting a DJ Griffin as opposed to a Mickey Gall. And you just look at the system that 
Bellator understands that Kevin Ferguson Jr., he could maybe be someone that is able to draw for us. Maybe this guy is going to have some ability to command an audience because of who he is. No different than CM Punk, but the difference was Punk was thrown against a wolf in his first fight, and it was it was totally different views upon bringing in an attraction, which I feel Kevin Ferguson Jr., he showed some, he definitely showed something in this yeah, fight. for sure. But, I mean, no one's deluding themselves to think this guy is a future champion yet. It's too early. No, it's too early. And as well, they both fight 170 pounds. So if CM Punk ever finds himself released from the UFC and does get picked up by Bellator, and that's a logical fight to put together. But it, it, in Baby Slice's uh, Kevin, Kevin Ferguson Jr., whatever you'd want to call him, really, in his case, he lost his Bellator debut. He got caught in a second round guillotine choke. And instead of just being like, oh, no, the guy's not ready for this level, you, you put him back in. You and bring also, him back no along. one saw that fight. I mean, they were Fair. strategic in, yeah, we could put him on the main card and maybe... It'll draw some viewers for the novelty, but he he lost the fight. It was on an undercard that nobody saw, and they didn't expose him on a national level so that he was thrown into that spotlight immediately, though they did put him here against a very a, yeah, a two and two fighter Abs- absolutely but if on paper when you're looking at his pro debut came against an 0 and 2 fighter now he's getting a guy that's more seasoned and at least has yep. experienced victory in his martial arts career and instead of being like okay well he just lost on a prelim he was very green he got caught in a guillotine he didn't actually get hit in that fight he just got caught in an unfortunate guillotine choke instead of just burying this guy in the prelim they still put him on a main card his next time out because they realize he has drawing power they realize that even though he had just lost there's still a market of people that are going to tune in to be like is he making improvements and they, they also had the same way. they also had the story of this was where his father's last fight was supposed to be with James Thompson that you you heard on the broadcast and Jimmy Smith bringing it up afterwards that that was a selling feature here was that here's his son going to the the same city where his dad was going to have his last fight last summer. Yeah, I think it's always been a good move for the Bellator promotion that even if you are 0-1, if there is a, a, an ability to put you on a card, they'll do that. Dylan Danis is 0-0 in MMA, but at least he's got a good uh, background in BJJ. He speaks a good game. At least people have a, a bit of an interest on in seeing this guy compete, and you can bring these guys in. The UFC has never done that. Apparently, Gokan Saki just got signed, so that would be incredible if that's the case because he's 0-1 in MMA, but... I think if there's a market for people that want to see you, then then put these guys on display. Allow the audience to tune in and, and to and to see them. And in in a Baby Slice's case, yeah, you're right. He's green. He's got a long way to go. He trains at a good t- camp with Antonio McKee, Body Shop Fitness in, in in California. And I think that he'll be able to grow and he'll be able to get better. But similar to these AJ McKees, start them off small, build them up. There's no need to have him fight Emmanuel Sanchez or or Georgie Karahanian right now, but build him up. And as a result, people are starting to tune in. People are starting to like this kid. People are starting to be like, oh, we got a few going with James Gallagher. Now you got a few going. Now you got some storylines going. Now you got some interest going. If they're starting to get some momentum, it's through making these storylines and making people want to see certain guys on the roster. And, and I think that that's a good addition is even an 0-1 fighter who's now 1-1 in Baby Slice. You're going to put him on your next main card. There's going to be some interest. You're going to build him from there. And so I, I like it. The main event, uh, Roy McDonald looked very good in his Bellator debut. The main event, it did 765,000 viewers peaked at 813 and then higher with their, their DVR viewership. I mean, when you include DV, DVR numbers, I think the peak was 955,000. Um, first of all, you know, I didn't really have um, that big of an issue with, with the, the tape delay because in the past we've seen – Live events that Spike has put on earlier to accommodate that, and they've been hurt by that. This number, when I saw the first numbers, they were definitely lower. Do you think that the tape delay nature um, did hurt this show at all? Yeah, so this one was a little different than the other tape delays. And the reason I say that is you look at like the Korshkov card versus Lima in Israel. That had no outlet other than you can watch it at 9 on Spike. Whereas mm-hmm. this one was on Spike UK on a 45-minute tape delay. So I think a lot of people that were that interested in it were able to go and stream it. The other thing is with some of these other cards, whether it's in Italy and it's Carvalho versus Manhoff or wherever it may be, the interest wasn't the same as a Rory McDonald fight. So I think a lot of people, instead of being like, oh, there's a Bellator card on this afternoon, but I don't really care. I'll just watch it tonight when I get home. Instead, they were like, oh, Rory's fighting. Oh, Chai Congo's fighting. Oh, McGeary versus Linton Vassell are fighting. I'm going to tune in. And if I can't tune in, I'm going to see spoilers online. It's as if 
you a, a good fight, you can contain it, possibly. You know, maybe people aren't going to watch it. Maybe people are going to not get the result. But a big fight, people are going to know the results. And a lot of people were talking about McDonald versus Daly between the time that the fight happened at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, until the time that it re-aired, which is like midnight. It was late by the time that the main event ended up going off. Maybe not quite midnight, but it was, a, you know, a later anyways. I thought that people probably knew the result. I thought that people probably weren't going to tune in and watch it live, so to speak. So in this case, I do think that the tape delay did hurt them because there was an audience in Europe that had already seen it. If you're in Europe and you want to watch this Ireland card, you, you can't. You physically have to watch it on Periscope or Facebook Live or be in the arena. Even though you're in Ireland, you can't watch it on Spike UK because Spike UK didn't carry it live. In this case, they carried it on that tape delay. And I think even though it was 45-minute tape delay, it beat the five, six hours that you had to watch it for a North American audience. So I think people probably streamed it or just found out results. Yeah, I think that they have this balancing act that when you go to a place like like the UK, are, are we going to cater this to our North American audience or to uh, do we want to be sending our fan base and try and grow this UK population by having an event that's starting after midnight? Uh, UFC has changed that stance with with Sweden. This weekend's card is not happening at three in the morning where that main event's going to get into the cage. And, you know, the one that flies in the face of the, the tape delay stuff is the Olympics, because quite often they're tape delayed and they were in London in 2012. And spoilers, if we want to call them that, they get out and they are not hurt at all when it comes to the Olympics, that they are. Uh, massive success uh, television wise with Bellator I think you're dealing with more of a hardcore audience and I don't know you and I talked about this last week off the air the fact that you and I were both going to know the results and you and I were both going to still be watching it on Friday night are we the exception or are we the the rule for the majority of Bellator fans how many of those I guess uh, 607,000 that they averaged for the broadcast knew the results going in. I'd be curious. Yeah, I'd have to say, if you want to put us in a category of, you know, the term's always hardcore fan, but let's just use that for the sake of a measurement here. If the ones that are actually going on websites or actively seeking out results. I imagine it's right. it's not a huge percentage, but it's it's probably a notable one. Fair enough. So I spoke a good, to a good friend of mine, Tyler Warman, friend at the network, and I asked him about what a baseball. Name drop. Yeah, I asked him about baseball, and I was like, uh, would you ever know that the Jays played, know that the Jays won, and then go home and rewatch the game? And he's just like, yeah, sometimes I do that. And I was like, you're, you're kidding me. He's like, no. See, I myself, I would never do that. I would never do that, but to flip that the other but side around. I, I would, 100%. Right, because that's the sport I'm interested in, right? Even if you knew the, the result of a wrestling match, whatever the case is, you're going to watch it because that's where you're interested in. So if you're a big I, I would say MMA three- fan, quarters of the rest like a lot of hours i watch i've read ahead i know i know what i'm watching yeah there's very few that i'm like outside of wwe it's pretty much all taped stuff that you know the results of yeah exactly so i think if you're a big 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 fan of the sport, get so much outrage now it. for bringing up pro wrestling <laughs> well hopefully not but uh, i just mean if you're if you're a big fan of the sport and that's something you support then you don't mind re-watching it but i think if, if tyler warman to name drop him again was in the two percent then you and i are in the two percent then how many of those people didn't know the results the people that did know the results and still want to watch it anyways well good on them but i, I would say that that's probably the, the minority percent of people Um, Did you have any um, strong thoughts about this past weekend's UFC athletes retreat, uh, bringing in just the the enormity of an undertaking like this to bring in, you know, three to four hundred fighters into Vegas? Um, They did a series of seminars with representatives from Reebok, Anheuser-Busch. Uh, which sounded like quite the uh, presentation. <laughs> quite the representative, I hear. Yeah, he he's getting. Uh, I, I don't know who this guy is. I mean, everyone's talking about this this presentation, but no one knows who this yeah, guy yeah, is. Yeah. And I I've sought out video of it. Um, <laughs> but I guess the big the big talking points coming out of it was uh, Chris Cyborg and Angela Magana having an incident after Magana had, had posted a photo mocking Cyborg, uh, comparing her to the the villain from Saw and. Here, Low blow. Here's Cyborg at, at a hospital. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty awful thing to post and got punched in the face for it. Mm-hmm. And then we had Cajun Johnson and Leslie Smith, who seemed to be the ones that were really pushing the, the unionization and Cajun Johnson bringing up the loss of sponsorship dollars. And uh, I know I'm going on a rant here, but uh, Cajun Johnson was on the MMA hour this week and he said he brought up the fact that maybe it wasn't the right time and place 
I would counter and said it was the perfect time and place to bring Absolutely. up these, su- these subjects. Look at the headlines that he's getting out of, out of it. I mean, just the fact that people are talking about, A, Cajun Johnson, who's someone who's been kind of floating under the radar, hasn't actually competed in a while. But B, I mean, if you're going to take a moment to jump up and say something where all your peers are in the same room, while the media attention is towards this weekend, where you have people from Reebok there, the right ears. If you're in the room with the right people that you want them to hear your message, this is the place. And he, he took the moment. But you are forgetting the probably the bigger headline than all of those things from the weekend. Mike Perry happened to put Jeremy Stevens down for grinding up on his girl. This was at the, at the Snoop, Snoop Dogg, Dogg concert. Show. <laughs> what has been What a weekend, John. What a weekend. This is I mean, on the scale, if I were to have said going into the weekend, we've got 400 UFC fighters going to Vegas this weekend, would the outcome of this weekend be above or below what you would have expected? Oh, yeah, ab- ab- above. To be honest, if you're going to say I'm putting 400 people in Vegas, a lot of them don't really got much going on right now, and we're going to fund a lot of it. We're flying them down there, paying for their hotels. We're putting on this fun stuff for them to do. Is something going to happen? Yeah. But it seems like a lot of stuff happened. And for that reason, we've seen you know International Fight Week before where all these fighters are in town. We've seen stuff where you know they've flown in a lot of the guys to, to have these policy meetings, whatever the case is. And you don't really hear about this stuff. In this case, that cyborg Angela Magana thing, that was huge on its own. That dominated a whole lot of headlines. That in its in and itself went above expectations of what was going to happen this weekend. But then just to hear about all the other stuff. And apparently there was, a, there was a number of reports of fighters having to be separated, people getting into each other's faces. And even small stuff like the shuttle bus, Des Green's like sitting next to Josh Emmett, who he um, just beat in his UFC Could debut. you imagine the like, optics? The logistics of it. Burt Watson is no longer there for you. I oh. mean, that in itself is a nightmare. But I'm sure the new UFC owners have uh, good people in place. If you put yourself into the shoes of these fighters, though, uh, the majority of complaints over the past year have been about money, have been about this sale, the the lack of a trickle down, no money from their television contract, the loss of sponsorship dollars. Do you go into this, especially if you're a seasoned fighter that has seen this, understands the business that what was the money that went into this weekend and would there have what would have happened if we had taken this pool and divided it amongst these 400 fighters? You know what I mean? It's like here we are. It's like, OK, how, how much did it cost to get Kobe Bryant to come yeah, speak hey, fair, for us? Fair a enough. Snoop Dogg fair concert. Enough. And here I am making five thousand dollars off this Reebok deal trying to live off two fights a year of which I'm putting camps together for. I mean, that is the crux of the problem here is that, I mean – Not a lot of these fighters have delusions of being millionaires if they are at a, you know, if they are the the 50th ranked guy in their division. But I think it's a reasonable expectation that I can have a comfortable living fighting for the the world's elite fighting organization. Yeah. So let's say you're a miner and you worked out in a mine, right? Uh, You get paid your hourly wage or let's say you're on salary, whatever the case is. But let's say it's a nickel mine. At the end of the year, or maybe sometimes it's it's twice a year, actually, you'll get your nickel bonus. Well, you might get a check in the mail for five grand because the mine's doing good and that's the money they're making money. So it's a trickle down effect. You're going to get your check out of that. Now, in the case of the UFC, if you're a miner and you're you're part time and you're a miner and you're full time, you get the same nickel bonus. Let's say the UFC is like scrap this this entire retreat idea idea we're gonna we can afford to give each guy three grand let's say right we can mail them each three grand but what if you just signed the ufc as a short notice replacement two weeks ago and you're 20 fights into your ufc career is it fair to send everybody the exact same amount of money so i think for the retreat it's like this is an appreciation thing we're going to show the guys that you know to some extent we care to some extent we do value your opinion cajun johnson could have got dragged out the back and cut i mean really I'm sure there would have been a, a false termination lawsuit there for him, but the UFC, he's an independent contractor. There's no reason why they could have just not said, screw this guy. He hasn't actually competed for us, I think, since 2015. Yep. There's no reason why he should even still be here right now. Angela Magana's on a four-fight losing streak. There's no reason she should even be there. But these are just people that still have UFC contracts are being invited out. So it's a bit of an appreciation thing. We're going to have them all come down. As well, I think they did want to talk, have them talk to you know the sponsorship uh, people. They wanted them to talk to the Reebok people. They wanted them to talk they, to they wanted, I think, to put, to put faces to these, exactly. these people. Even and just th- having a Mary Area manual go out to breakfast with them and just say, hey, listen, this is the direction that we want to take the company. I think that, that all helped out. So there, there was a plan Do for Do you think them. he picked up the tab for breakfast? <laughs> I would have to imagine so. Oh, I mean, my uh, wallet is back at the I hotel. think it's uh, somewhere. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, <laughs> you cover me this time? You're an owner now. I, I, I look at that and that's where I see this will always have problems. And listen – you can look at the disparity between 
the, the sale and and what the fighters have lost lots at the end of the day it is on the fighters the ufc are not incentivized to just out of the goodness of their heart cut into their profits they will deal with the bad press. Mm-hmm. They will deal with the disgruntled fighters. It is on the fighters to have a united front to demand that we get a portion of this upcoming television contract, to demand that this Reebok deal is is better allocated, that we can that we can make more money off of this. And that's where it becomes let's say the TV deal, we're gonna cut you guys into five percent of it. If I am John Jones. Are you telling me that I deserve the exact same amount as Angela Magana? Yeah, no fair. And that's where this is not a team sport where it's just it's equally distributed amongst teams. It's like these are all individuals that have individual motives. They are not at the end of the day going to go to war for 400 others. They're concerned about themselves. And that's I think a large portion of why we've never seen an association you know, outside of the MMA FA, which has been the one that has stood the test of time, but we're still at the reality of where organization is amongst the fighters. It just seems like in 2017, it's hard to put together a union. If you look at unions that are already existing, they've been existing or they've been around for quite some time. The idea of being able to band all these people together and fight the machine just seems to be dying off. And yeah, would it be a good idea for the fighters? Absolutely. Should they get what they deserve? Absolutely. But unfortunately, yeah, like you said, they've got all band together and that banding all together, there becomes the issue of, well, we're not all in this together. Why am I going to help somebody whom I don't know and put my neck on the line when realistically I know I only have six to eight years at the highest level in the sport, maybe to push my boundaries, to push my body to its limits, make as much money as I possibly can and get out. If you look at the communist system, I mean, yeah, it always sounds good on paper, equal distribution, everyone's getting their fair share. That's all the sounds, that all sounds great. But when you realistically look at it, why would a doctor be making the same money, amount of money as somebody who's working at a fast food restaurant? Well, it's equal distribution. Everyone's on the same level. Everyone's the same. Yeah, but you got to realize that if you're working harder and you're you know, I don't want to say more gifted, but you're more hardworking and you've furthered your career along and you, you're worth more to somebody else. So this idea that everybody should be able to get the same amount, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, yeah, John Jones is going to get paid more than Angela Magana. But the thing is, is, you bring in this union, then all of a sudden you don't know what's going on here. You don't know, let's say the Reebok deal. The Reebok deal signed for seven years, so it's not going anywhere. Even if a union starts tomorrow, the union still got to factor in that the deal's already been signed. So what do you do? Do you say, well, instead of going this whole, you've been fighting in the UFC for 20 fights, so you're going to get X amount what if you just divvy it all up equally well yeah that's great for the people who on the card that's only fought a couple times in the ufc but that doesn't work for the high end so no one's ever just going to band together and you look at some of these big stars you see old Cain velasquez and, and tim kennedy and donald cerrone and george champier do you know how fast all of them have ran away now do you know how fast all of them have just taken their name away from this maybe tim kennedy's the last person that's still sticking with it him and bjorn Rebney. but quite frankly tim kennedy seems more interested in enlisting back in the army right now than he does fighting for this this whole union position he's retired he really realize, you know what, it's a fight that you could fight forever. It's just a fight that's never really gaining any ground. I mean, none of these union projects have really gained any ground. The best you can do is just have some longevity and stick in it. But has that gotten Nate Corey anywhere? Is John Fitch better off putting all of his time coming to these court hearings, putting all of his time into trying to do all this stuff? Are these guys all better off in their career? Well, who knows, right? Only time will really tell. Do I think a union should be in place for these guys? Absolutely. But also, a part of me doesn't really like unions. Not in everyday work life anyways. So sporting unions, yes, I do believe they should be there. But it's also, is it going to hurt the sport? I don't know. The sport's not making a whole lot of money. The people that just bought the UFC must be realizing this wasn't a great investment. Well, from so for the them now to give away profit makes it an even worse investment. You also have two competing philosophies. If you are very much in the favor of the fighters earning their fair share, of course you want to see this. And and I fall into that camp. I, I think there's a giant disparity. However, if you are a fan at home that just wants to see one company have a monopoly on the best fighters and match the best fighters together, which is how the UFC has risen in that popularity, you're not looking at this as something that is in your best interest, that you want to see fighters have... Uh, a bigger share of the pie that they could – if you could install the, the Ali Act and they are suddenly – they can go wherever they'd like and go to the highest bidder. You just want to see the best fights possible. Yeah. And, it, and it favors a fan wanting a monopoly uh, and just to take these fighters as though they're action figures and put the best ones in the cage every single month and get the best fights possible where it's one side with all of the control. 
Yeah, but it comes back down to a moral stance at that point. If you look at when baseball, back to take that, that example, was the best, you got Ken Griffey and all these guys, Mark McGuire, cr- Barry Bonds, crushing home runs. It's fun. It's great to watch. That plays better for the audience. The ratings are the highest it's ever been. People are into this home run derby. But then you realize that they're on something. If you want to look at what's better for the audience, what's better for the audience, John, sitting at home, is not having USADA. Why? Because fights are not just going to get canceled the last minute because somebody tested positive. And I want, as a viewer, audience back home i want bigger faster athletes i want the best possible action i want vitor belfour a guy that probably shouldn't be spinning through the air like a, a majestic dragon kicking people in the head the guy shouldn't be able to do that but now all of a sudden he can well why would i want usada then what does that benefit me as a fan well there's got to be a moral issue here man and we we need usada because we don't want these fighters killing each other we want it to be a level playing field for themselves yeah well, exactly there's the other issue is that somebody eventually goes on a rampage no pun intended rampage jackson almost became that guy when he's slamming that truck through traffic but yeah i mean someone's just gonna hurt somebody at some point and then the issue becomes larger than it is that maybe we should have taken care of these guys there's no doubt that it's fun to see what the human body is capable of at the highest level but that's just being selfish you need an even playing field so that you can have some of these true martial artists go in there and you know fight to the best of their ability and have good performances against people that are in the same talent pool in the same everything really i mean the body wasn't meant to go to some of those levels but there's no denying that as a spectator at home it's fun to watch so a lot of hardcore fans we'll use that term again a lot of hardcore fans will always say pride was better than the ufc and pride there was no drug testing all these guys were juiced to the gills and it was fun fights john but at some point you got to realize that the sport has just moved on you know it's not barbaric like that and so i see this as a similar case it's like you know, yes, I as a as a fan, I want the UFC to have all the best fighters, and I want them to force them to all fight each other, and I want to see that at my display as much as possible. But you know, as a human being and as someone who actually likes the sport and actually likes the fighters, I need a lot of organization so that the free agency market's alive and well. I need good opportunities for these guys all over the globe. I need all these things for them, right? But that just comes back to you know what side of the fence you find yourself on. The UFC, after much discussion is installing an interim middleweight championship. Surprise, surprise. Uh, You and I had been in favor of this for quite some time, that it solves a lot of problems of the logjam. That is 185 pounds. It'll be Yoel Romero against Robert Whitaker added to the UFC 213 card on July the 8th in Las Vegas, part of International Fight Week. That joins the Amanda Nunez-Valentina Shevchenko title fight. So what we have is, I I would say, a... A good pay-per-view lineup. This is not going to be one of the the massive cards of the year that I think most have that expectation for. But to me, that this interim middleweight title, it solves a lot of problems. Yes, it's an interim title. But to me, the positive far outweighs the negative of an added championship because this thing was a disaster. Yeah, it's been a disaster for a while. I just don't see why you don't strip Michael Bisping, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, yeah, he's the champion, but his first defense is a razor close fight against Dan Henderson. And prior to that, he beat Luke Rockhold, who, you know, is not someone that's really in the spotlight right now either. If he wants to wait for this George St. Pierre fight, that's totally his decision. But I would have told him, Mike, here's the option. You either fight Yoel Romero and you defend this title, or you vacate the title and take the super fight. Super fight, title defense. Your choice, 100% your choice. And you know what he would have taken the super fight? There's more money in it for him. He's already won the title. And, you know, at the end of the day, he can go to bed not, no, or sorry, knowing to himself, I never lost that title. Isn't there some onus on the, on the UFC to have, de- have delivered the fight that they have promoted, that they have held a press conference for? Yeah, well, then then if you're going to deliver that fight for the George St. Pierre, here's the issue with this George St. Pierre fight now, right? If you have Yoel Romero fight Robert Whitaker for the interim title, let's just say Yoel Romero happens to win. Now his first title defense is Gegard Mousasi. You've got like a version of the title that people respect that's being fought between Yoel Romero and Robert Whitaker and Gegard Mousasi. And you've got the other version of the title that Michael Bisming's fighting George St. Pierre for, it makes no sense. It's like your A league and your B league. You've got a guy that's never even fought at 185 pounds taking on to a guy that's overachieving by getting the title in the first place. I mean, a super fight, great. A money fight, great. If we want to call it that, then that's what we'll call it. But I mean, it's ludicrous to think that these are the two best guys in the world. So now you have a version of the title, which is the interim version. You know, it's not even the full version. And- it's going to be viewed in, in a lesser light, even though the people competing for it are the better competitors. And, and my final thing on that is that it's a really good fight. I do really like it. But Robert Whitaker, great winning streak right now. Huge win over Jacare. Love this guy. I have him as a top middleweight in the world. But I, I would have liked to see Musasi there. I think that he's probably earned it. So here, here is where I'll disagree that when the UFC treats their business as a business, 
We understand that. Mm-hmm. When they put together, quote unquote, money fights, even if it flies in the face of of logic or rankings, we understand that. So why, when Michael Bisping treats himself as a business, which he is doing here against George, is that condemned? If the UFC wanted to bridge the gap, hey, I'll fight Yoel Romero. I want a guarantee of X million dollars that I stood to make for this fight that you had already promoted and held a press conference for that I am sacrificing to make less for Yoel Romero. You make the difference. I bet that fight happens for Michael Bisping. Yeah, listen, if I'm if I'm Michael Bisping, I'm sitting on the sidelines too. I'm not rushing back for anything. Listen, I've done my part. I've given back this company. I've been a company man. There's no reason for me to put my neck on the line and get smashed up here. So I'm going to wait for what was promised to me, which is this George What do you think the paydays fight? were coming off of tough for that guy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's very much worked his way up. But also, there's got to be that element of... And listen, this does him no good. The fans would appreciate it. The UFC would appreciate it. But at the end of the day, was Rich Franklin better off taking those catchweights at 195 on short notice against the uh, the best guys in the UFC? Maybe not. But he was a company guy. He's always willing to go out there. And now, you know, whether that benefited him or not, only he truly knows. But there's also that element of Michael Bisping is a guy that being a fan favorite or not, love him or hate him, whatever you do, the guy's been long, around a long time. He was never a middleweight champion he never was he was never the number one contender he always kind of like lost that fight before he could have ever challenged for the title but now everything happens to go perfectly right for him he gets this short notice opportunity against luke rockhold the cards are finally in line he lands that punch it's a huge moment and instead of being like wow the ufc finally gave me that opportunity i made good on it instead of any of that it's well now you know i want to fight dan henderson Oh, well, I beat Dan Henderson. You know, I deserve a money fight. Maybe you do deserve it. Maybe you have been plugging around for a long time, but there's a flow to the UFC. You know why you said it's the number one organization in the world? Because they have a monopoly on the fighters, but people want to see the number one guy fight the number two guy. This idea of money fights, that's only new. That's only actually an idea that's been introduced to mixed martial arts in the last couple of years, namely because Conor McGregor has been floating that term out. But now you've got guys like Tyron Woodley that are talking about it, and the fans have turned on Tyron Woodley. And you've got Michael Bisping talking about it, and the fans have turned on Michael Bisping. And the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> sorry, the fact of the matter is, is that if you're the guy that's like, I'm unwilling to fight, I just want the big money fight, the fans are going to turn on you, and that in itself is going to kill your drawing power. So should Michael Bisping just go back out there? Yes, but money-wise and business-wise, no, he's doing what's, what's right, and that's sitting on the sideline and getting the biggest fight possible. Uh, we also have uh, Demetrius Johnson, who is set to fight in August. We don't have a finalized <laughs> bout agreement. TJ Dillashaw is uh, the fight with Cody Garbrandt is officially off of UFC 213. And now Dillashaw wants the flyweight title fight. First of all, can you possibly see, see TJ Dillashaw get on a scale that says 125? You know what? He's not the biggest 35er out there. I think if he really committed himself to making 25, sure. But quite honestly, he's getting older. He's not that young kid anymore. And he's a former champion at 135. He's one of the best guys in the world. That's a big chance, dropping those 10 pounds. You don't know how your body's going to react. And in two and a half months. In two and a half months. It doesn't really make any sense. And if you're Demetrius Johnson, you're kind of preparing for Ray Borg a little bit. But also... Is there a drastic difference between those two fights? If you're Demetrius Johnson. Um, if, If you're... If you are promoting the, this fight, you're going to Seattle. The story is this breaks Anderson Silva's record with Demetrius Johnson. Is TJ Dillashaw a significantly more attractive opponent uh, oh, yeah. for, for a promotion? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, just a bigger opponent name-wise. He's a former champion. I mean, it, it's a good fight to put together. <clears throat> but also... If you're taking on Ray Borg and you're going to break the record, and that's in itself is a big moment, but it's the same thing in that Wilson Hayes fight, right? It, it, or or whatever it really is. If you're Demetrius Johnson, I'm going to tie the record, but I'm a nine to one favorite. I'm going to beat the I'm going to beat the record, but I'm a seven and a half to one favorite. So there's not really interest. If he takes on T.J. Dillashaw, I have to assume he's slight favorite, or if not, pretty much a pick 'em fight, and that in itself is okay. We're going to see the greatest flyweight champion of all time, one of the best pound-for-pound fighters of all time, one of the best American fighters of all time, hell, one of the best fighters of all time in general. Step up, take up that big fight, improve all those things that we say about him. Then, yeah, I think that in itself is a big fight, and you can sell it a lot better, so I do like it. I I want to see the Dillashaw fight, and myself, like, that's the fight I I want to see. And to be honest, like, with Ray Borg, I I do hold... Him missing weight twice (laughs) against him. His last one, he was 129 and a half pounds when he fought Louis Smolka. So, I mean, there... 
to me, there's equal concern about Ray Borg ma- making this weight as TJ Dillashaw, who has not missed weight. Yeah, and Ray Borg, as well, you got to factor in the fact that he's got to go five rounds. So if you do have any type of difficult weight cut and then you have to compound the fact that you have to fight those extra rounds, yeah, it's going to make it difficult. It's just the fact that there's not really any challengers at 125, so Ray Borg is the guy that jumps out. But if the challengers are better at 135, then yeah, jump up. It's just what I don't understand is I thought if TJ would fight Demetrius Johnson... I figured it would be at 135, to be honest with you. The fact is, DJ's pulling the Ronda card and being like, I ain't going up. You can come down if you want some of this. And if TJ decides to do that, then props to him. But you look at it like that business move, right? Is TJ going to get paid more money to take on Demetrius Johnson than he is to take on Cody Garbrandt? No. Probably not. But he wants to fight Cody Garbrandt. And 135 is his class. And he can regain the title that he wants. Yeah, I mean, it would make a lot more sense for TJ Dillashaw just to take that fight. But, hey, what do I know? I think it makes a lot of sense to put Dwayne Ludwig versus Justin Buckles on the undercard. Oh, my God, after this week. (laughs) Yeah, great. Where where are you at the the Team Alpha Male feud (laughs) with... With Dillashaw and Ludwig. Like, I have long <laughs> since hit my expiration on this feud. They have clearly not. And ha- what an awkward altercation between Buckles and Ludwig. And Ludwig just wanted no part of this at all on Tough this week. I yeah, mean, yeah, he, he played it pretty good because Ludwig in real life, you know, is not an aggressive guy, but, like, he don't take no shit. Like, he's not going to back down, that's for damn sure. And I just thought that, you know what, this is like a... It's a boiling over point. Like, at first, they used to be courteous to a certain extent, and now it's not at all. I mean, you saw this beginning of the season, Justin Buckles being like, I thought you'd beat Cruz, TJ. But now it's just like, you know, you're a traitor. You left us. You never did anything. They're just going back and forth. And whereas I thought a lot of it was fabricated emotion, you can tell that they just don't really like each other. The thing for me is that they're almost lucky that this season of Tough isn't being raved about because Cody Garbrandt comes off awful. I just agree. like a very unlikable person. And this is I think TJ Dillashaw is, is such a more sympathetic it. figure in this. Absolutely. after this show and I don't think he had that public opinion prior to the show but you're right this is not um, a gigantic I mean you go back to a season that was more highly viewed the the Rousey Tate season where it was the same dynamic and coming out of it I mean you had you had some boos for Ronda at that fight with Tate it was more so her blowing off Tate at the end of the fight not shaking her hand but it was largely I don't think it swayed public opinion i think rousey was unaffected by her portrayal on that show you know what it's possible that she was unaffected but i think tate gained a big boost out of it i mean even just that rock climbing the coach's challenge where rousey gets to the top and then rings the bell and and she's flipping her off and tate's just kind of like okay it's like this is an unlikable human being she's just not a likable person whereas tate is comes off as being the victim you sympathize you sympathize with the victim you want them to win and even though you're watching this fight you're like ah you know what i get rousey's the favorite but I want the dog to come through. In this case, it's like Cody Garbrandt's the champ. The guy's, you know, a spectacular fighter. One of the better fighters at 135 pounds. Just beat Cruz. But you're, you want Dillashaw to win. You want Dillashaw. Because at first, people were thinking the same thing. Traitor. Guy's a traitor. Guy's a traitor. But now you're thinking, guy got out of a toxic environment. Why would you want to subject yourself to that all the time? It's a great point you bring up that if you are, if you are just a fringe fighter, watching this what kind of an advertisement <laughs> is this for team alpha male Bad. right a bunch of bullies a bunch of frat house bullies that are basically just written like we're talking about has this grudge been played out to its full extent you know why we're thinking that because it's like why are they not letting this go why is this still an issue why are they still harping on Dwayne ludwig over nothing the fact that cody garbrandt's already grabbed tj's neck and then in this season you got to drag the guy off and he tries to run back over and he's trying to throw it's like He's just not a very likable guy. And listen, here's the thing for me. It's tough for me, right? Because if I look at it, you know, Cody Fister is now recently retired. And Cody Gibson just lost at 145 pounds jumping up for the Tachi Palace fighting. Cody East, checkered history. You know, he's released from the UFC now. Cody Bollinger, boy, oh boy, that guy's career has just completely fallen off the radar. But Cody Garbrandt, I mean, he's the guy that's holding the flag for us here, John. And I just got to say, you know, I'm very, very disappointed in him. I forgot your personal vested interest here in the, the <laughs> of outcome of uh, Cody Garbrandt here do you see any similarities between not so much the reaction um and they'll claim she's still a part of the camp but between tj dillashaw leaving and Paige van zandt moving uh up to washington yeah, where so it's funny i mean she happens. still has the affiliation yeah. she has not officially left that gym but 
one has to draw the conclusion. I mean, that is not going to be her day-to-day gym. Yeah, I, I think when you're looking at those type of fighters, you're looking at Paige Van Zant, someone that coming from, I believe, was the Reno Combat Academy in yes. Vegas. So coming out of a gym, she was already a little bit established. She had already fought in the UFC, and now she's coming over to Team Alpha Male to kind of hone her skills. If you're looking at a guy like Cody Garbrandt, I mean, he's a guy that showed up to the uh, to, to Team Alpha Male. He had already been competing. A lot of these guys had already been competing. But if you look at, like, the Lance Palmers, or you look at, like, the, the TJ Dillashaws, TJ Dillashaw got recruited out of high school by Uriah Faber. This is a guy that knew I'm going to fight in MMA, knew I have a team that's supporting me, and those guys did have a very big added interest in it. So I look at, uh, Chael Sonnen said it on his podcast the other day, and it was brilliant, but it was like, who coached Michael Jordan when he was a kid? I, I don't know, but people know who coached him in the NBA. The thing is, it doesn't matter who coached him in the NBA because as an NBA coach, you're given a $100 million budget and the best players in the world. So you didn't really develop anybody. You just got a roster of guys. If you look at ATT, ATT's created very few people. Robbie Lawler came there as a fighter and won the title. Manny Nunez came there as an established fighter and won the title. Joanny and Jacek went there as an established fighter. It's what gyms are actually physically creating fighters. And in Team Alpha Male's case, they created TJ Dillashaw. They can actually take credit on that the argument here becomes was tj dillashaw as good as he possibly was going to get before Dwayne ludwig showed up because there's no denying that when Dwayne ludwig was at team alpha male they all looked better faber's striking was looking better lance palmer's striking was looking better joseph benavidez's striking was looking better they were chad mendez's striking was looking better they were all looking infinitely better with Dwayne ludwig so ludwig leaves because it's a toxic environment you know he just gets out of there he decides i'm going to just open up my own gym that's fine why would you ever really nobody faults henry who for leaving the black zillion Nobody faults those guys that want to just go off and start their own thing. If Brandon Gibson left Jackson's and started up his own gym, which is not crazy, no one's going to fault him. So why does anybody fault Dwayne Ludwig for going back home to Colorado to open up a gym? It makes no sense. But TJ obviously got along with this guy. He's also obviously familiar with him. And he's obviously excited for the improvements he's making. So he follows him. And I think it's easy to be a like, snake in the grass, you know, a traitor. But really think about it. Was that a bad move on TJ Dillashaw's part? People will say, well, he lost to Cruz. So it was a bad move. That was a close fight. The kid's a talented guy. He's in a better place now. His, him and his wife are in a better place now. You cannot fault this guy. But I think that if you're looking at the season for who's coming off better, infinitely TJ yeah. Dillashaw, who seems just like a, a sharper kid, a nicer kid, and I think he'll gain a lot of fans going into the, the fight with Garbrandt. Yeah, and I think you also have to look at this this feud that they are very much incentivized to amplify this on television for the fact that you are – at the time of this filming, we're building to a fight at the end of the season. But um, speaking about the fight that went down on The Ultimate Fighter, we had Ramsey Nidjim defeat Julian Lane in one of Julian Lane's finer performances up good until the fight. end. Absolutely good I fight. I thought this was the best fight of the season. Yeah, yeah, fun and fight. And Nidjim, I mean, my God, the way he just shot into these guillotines, I mean, it was... Um, I was very surprised at how well Julian Lane performed there. Yeah, and I, I think he's yeah. a lock for one of the wild card spots. Yeah, I think he's a lock. The only thing I'm not 100 percent sure is that he. I believe he suffered a laceration, so we'll, I guess we'll see if if anything comes out of that. But yeah, the first guillotine choke, I'm thinking this thing is tight. The second one, I'm thinking shades of James Vick, where Randy Ninjam does the same thing. He leaves his neck on the far outside yeah. on the single leg, and it gets snatched up. Vick's got a nasty guillotine choke. Julian Lane's not really a 170 pounder, but neither is Ninjam. So when he had that second one, it flips to mount. I'm thinking he's about to squeeze him out was it an early stoppage yeah you know what maybe you let it go on i think garbrin had a good point this is a redemption season you gotta let them fight in that regard if you're julian lane you might be able to get that wild card slot but beyond that this is a guy that was coming into tough i think coming off two straight losses this is his last shot let the guy fight i not only want to see julian lane get the wild card spot i want to see them do the rematch in the next round between these two it was a good fight i would totally do the rematch absolutely i think the only other possibility is for the wild card they're going to obviously pick two if we assume lane is one of them uh are Eddie Gordon and Johnny Nunez the, the two that jump out at you? Because oh. these others are Seth Pashinsky, Mehdi Baghdad, and Haider Hassan. Yeah, so I actually kind of like Mehdi Baghdad. I think that he got a not an unfair shake against Jesse Taylor, but, I mean, he just got taken down repeatedly against a bigger guy whom he used to train with and got held down. He doesn't have any damage on him. He is, you know, one of the better accredited fighters on the season right now. I can see him getting it. Eddie Gordon, no way. First of all, I don't know that he can make the weight again. I mean, it's a light weight for him, and he did not look good. Johnny Nunez, even even though he's that short notice guy, even though he's the guy that was definitely jumping up a weight class because he's not a big welterweight in the slightest bit, he did have a good fight with yeah, James Krause. He did. And for that reason, if we're going on merit, then he deserves it more than the other two. Baghdad just got completely grounded. Eddie Gordon got choked out by Tom Galicchio. Yeah, I think that Johnny Nunez deserves it if that's what we're basing it on. 
And hell, I mean, Julian Lane versus Johnny Nunez. Oh my Sign God. me up. That's a good fight. Yeah. Uh, I do, did a, sh- a slight change to this winners or losers this week. Instead of me stating who my winners and losers are, I'm just going to throw out a name and you just say winner or loser okay. and I will agree or disagree. Paul Daly this past week, was he at the end of everything a winner or a loser over the past week? Most definitely a loser, but being able to set up this fight with Michael Venom Page and draw some interest off that, I mean, Paul Daly said going into this fight, I would like to retire by 35. That's something like six, six, seven months away. If he's got one last big fight in him coming off this Rory loss, do the Venom Page fight, that's great. But I've never seen a guy move on from a, a loss so quickly. Didn't like, care. A, what a pivot. Well, it's as if he already thought in his head. The fact that he even said, I'm, I might retire by 35, or I'm looking to retire by 35. The fact that that idea is even floating in your head, this guy's been around for a long time. 50 pro fights plus a kickboxing career. I mean, it didn't look like it packed it in against Rory, but it seemed like after that first round, he knew if I get taken. Taken down, I'm going to swing here in the round two. But if it don't work and I get taken down again, well, what am I going to do? And then, yeah, so he, he, he is definitely a loser on the weekend. Liam McGeary. Oh, loser. And I said that was likely going to happen. Linton Vassello you grapples did. him. And uh, yeah, lo- this is the kryptonite. And now we know that he can't fix it. We know that. And get, look at that light yeah. heavyweight division when you have Ryan yeah. Bader, Phil Davis, Muhammad Lawal They're all above him. All that them. is going to be really tough for this guy. I don't know if this loss sets him back that he is able to make those adjustments, but he's no, not a 34, young fighter. 34 years old, and then and as I mentioned going into the fight, is that he likes playing off of his back, and the issue is you can catch Tito or Kelly Anunson if they take you down, but you can't catch the better guys, and Linton Vassell's a good grappler. And you look at Phil Davis, he's a great grappler, but even the other guys you mentioned, King Mo and uh, Ryan Bader, you, you couldn't catch these guys with a triangle off your back? No, it just becomes increasingly difficult. Could he go back to the drawing board and fix these things? You'd think he would have by now, and at 34, I just don't see him getting any better than he currently is. So he, he's a big loser on the weekend because, I mean, where does he go from here? Big question mark. Check Congo. He's won five straight. But, man, I don't know. This guy is just death when you put him on television. Yeah, winning his heavyweight in Bellator history. So, I mean, he's a winner on what the weekend. What an league. accomplishment. He doesn't take any damage whatsoever. And the thing is, is that the guys he's fighting aren't spectacular, but he just, he finds a way to make it happen. I mean, Augusto Sakai had literally had no answers for him. He just, once he got his back, at the first round, he was trying to pummel at least. Rounds two and three, he was so gassed from trying to pummel, he at least just resorted to just hanging on the fence. Now, the thing with Chai Kongo is those fights could go the other way. If they would have scored it for Sakai saying, well, he stuffed the takedowns and landed a couple shots, you wouldn't be that upset. But at 42 years old, Chai Congo's not looking to get into these wild brawls. He's not looking to stand and bang with these guys. And this is not a heavyweight title fight. So why lay it on the line for that one big performance when you're on the opening card of a tele, uh, of a pre- tape delayed card, sorry, in Europe? Chai Congo didn't take any damage. And I have a good friend of mine. He always messages me. A lot of people think the guy's crazy. But he's absolutely right in a lot of regards. And he'll say something like Ryan Hall versus Gray Maynard, for example. He said, what a, what a great performance by Ryan Hall. I was like, what are you talking about? I don't want to tell him this. I said, oh, you think so? <laughs> Took no damage and won the fight. You know, that's how a lot of people, George St. Pierre is the same way. Is it the most entertaining fight in the world? No, but it's dominating. And he can go back to training camp. He can go back to the next fight, not taking any damage. Chai Congo took no damage. And for a 42 year old man to take on a top heavyweight who is some 11 years younger than him and to become the winningest heavyweight in Bellator history. Yeah. I mean, it has to be looked as a win. Michael Bisping. Loser. I say winner because I think he gets what he wants now out of all of this with the title. Yeah, added. yeah. No, ultimately, if we're looking at this for, for personal reasons, yeah, he's the winner. He'll get more money out of this. This is the bigger opportunity. But and, you don't approve. Well, yeah, I'm selfish in that regard, I suppose. It's fine. We should, uh, we should disagree. <laughs> TJ Dillashaw, winner or loser this past week because <laughs> loser. He, he loses he lost one fight. fight. Yeah, the fight's big, though. This is the fight. I mean, you put a whole season of The Ultimate Fighter around it. There was a good storyline. You have that emotion. I mean, just think about all this stuff that's going on in the season. When you watch it now, it has less of an effect because you know the fight's not going to happen. But if we were still under the impression that the fight was going to happen, it builds up to that. You know what? Ooh, you know what? I want to see what they're going to get like that. Cody Garbrandt seems like a very emotional guy. But as emotional as he went into the Cruz fight with, he was calm the fight you know what i mean maybe he just that's how he fires himself up maybe that's how he he deals well with the situation but even just the talks of i'm going to release this video of me knocking you out in the gym it adds something so if you're tj dillashaw you had this storyline you had this big fight to make and now you know and now what they're talking about well maybe he can drop an extra 10 pounds and compete in eight weeks like no i went from having something to look forward to a good prize and a big prize to now some uncertainty some sit on the sidelines some uh, the other thing, too, is if you're Cody Garbrandt against TJ Dillashaw and TJ Dillashaw gets hurt, they find you a, a, a replacement. This fight goes on. 
Gar- Cody Garbrandt gets hurt, you're TJ Dillashaw. They're not finding a replacement because you're just going to wait for the next shot, right? So I'm sure he doesn't want to sit on the sidelines because he's been sitting on the sidelines. He wants to get in there. He wants to compete. And for that reason, this has to be considered as a big blow to him. Final one, looking into the future to Sunday. Who will be the winner or loser? Glover Teixeira versus Alexander Gustafsson. I'm going to have to go with Alexander Gustafsson. And also, this likely puts him in a great, great spot to end up with another title shot. I mean, if he takes on Jimmy Manuel, well, he's already taken on Jimmy Manuel and he's got the win over him. But if you're now Anthony Johnson's out of the picture, well, that really creates a good scenario here because you've got John Jones and Daniel Cormier, who Alexander Gustafsson had fight of the years with both of them. So I think that... At least in my opinion. I mean, great fights, all, all I can say. So I think it sets up a good situation if you're Gustafson that you can get another fight for the light heavyweight title, even though he's someone that's lost the top challengers in the world. And this fight's at Sweden. When we talk about them catering to the European market, normally they cater to the North American audience, right? And hey, let's let's have this card play at some odd time in Sweden so we can sell some of these stars. But in here, they don't care because they have good European stars. And those European stars are big stars. You're in Sweden. You've got Alexander Gustafsson, the greatest Swedish fighter that's ever competed in mixed martial arts. This is should be his coming out party and even though Glover takes there is a very tough guy he's also a guy that's you know getting a little long in the tooth been around the game for a long time always going to have that puncher's chance but take out the Anthony Johnson knockout Alexander Gustafson does have a pretty solid chin on him so it's going to be a fun fight and all around this is actually a fun little card so that's going on Sunday. We'll wrap things up here with Cody. You can follow him at CJ Safdick on Twitter. And up next, we've got part two of my chat with Misha Serkinov, who's going to be fighting on Sunday against the man Volkan Uzdemir. Volkan. Ranked ahead of uh, one Misha Serkinov. We will see what happens <laughs> on Sunday. Uh, here's Misha chatting about the contract issues he had with the UFC coming out of the Nikita Krylov fight and other notes going into Sunday's fight in Sweden. First of all, this fight with Volkan Uzdemir, when you heard it was going to be in Sweden, the last time they were over there, the fighters had to go into the cage at about 3 in the morning. So for you, this has been adjusted and you're fighting at a, at a normal time in Sweden. So that has to be a benefit, I would assume. I just, you know, it, for me, it doesn't really matter what time. As long as I have my nap before mm-hmm. and rest it, you know, it's totally fine. Like, time difference doesn't really matter for it, me personally. Has that always been the case? Did you ever have a, a prior experience where you've had to deal with that? I mean, I used to uh, compete for Canada in uh, wrestling, judo, BJJ. So sometimes I'll be in Korea, completely different time zone. Uh, Guatemala, different time zone. So you know, I, I used to I used to deal with that kind of stuff before. This card, it's a big focus on the light heavyweight division, obviously with uh, Alexander Gustafsson, Glover to share in the main event. Your fight uh, with Volkan Uzdemir. Are you sensing, especially over the past year, that you know you go back a year and people were looking at who are going to be the next contenders, and you're starting to see. I, I think a lot of fighters emerge within this division, and, and light heavyweight is starting to get a lot of a lot more focus and you're a big part of that yeah it's just you know i always knew where i wanted to be i always work hard i always believed in myself and uh just you know i'm happy to finally kind of like unfold everything and like you know be part of it but you know i always wanted to be here and i always work really really hard towards this kind of moment and uh just happy that finally i'm here do you feel that the Nikita Krylov fight was a turning point for you and your perception amongst fans? Did you sense a, a big turn after that victory? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Nikita is uh, he's a very, very tough guy, you know. Um, he's a great striker. He's light on the feet. He has great reach. He has a good fighting experience. Uh, he was coming off fight, five f- uh, wins in a row, all by stoppages, submissions, knockout. So I knew it was a really, really tough fight. And, uh, you know, him being uh, top 10 in the world in rankings and all that. And it was definitely a turning point fight. And having that fight in Toronto, uh, everyone watching, uh, it was a lot of pressure. I didn't say anything. I didn't want to kind of believe into it. But seeing, like, walking to the cage and seeing all the faces that I didn't see in, like, you know, 10, 15 years. And everyone was there. Everyone was supporting. Everyone was cheering. It was really, really exciting. So I just tried to kind of, you know, tunnel everything and just do my job. Did you take that experience fighting in Toronto? Was that added pressure that, that you, you found to be a positive pressure that you put on yourself? Or is it something that fighting in your hometown, it, it just it added all of these other obstacles for you in addition to just the fight at hand? You definitely added more obstacles because, uh, you know, every, first of all, I'm fighting a guy who's ranked higher than me, who has way more fights than me. Um, and... Uh, 
meanwhile I have everyone supporting me here and everyone expecting me to win. And again, for some reason, I'm a, I'm a favorite, you know, in this fight. Meanwhile, he's a very, very tough guy, and he should be a favorite. And then uh, it's just a lot of pressure because everyone expects me to win against somebody such a like elite level guy, you know. So it was it was challenging, but at the same time, after I went through that, like it just made me so much stronger, so much better. Which uh, it was a great experience, and uh, I definitely learned a lot from that fight in particular. And uh, you guys are going to see um, other really, really good performances in the future. After the, the fight w- with Krylov, you've got all of this momentum. There's a lot of focus on yourself. And then you kind of had to slip out of fighter mode and into your, you are your own manager. And you had to deal with, with the, the contract issue at that time. Tell me what you learned about that experience and coming out of it. Was it at all... Uh, was it a growth period for you just in terms of that element of the business and dealing with that? Oh, yeah, 100%. Because now you're just not fighting in the ring, but you're just trying to fight, uh, fight for a better contract at the same time. And, uh, but I think I dealt with it really, really good. Like Dana White, he's awesome. Mick Maynard, they're, they're amazing people. And we did uh, came to a, a good agreement. And uh, I'm happy the way everything planned out and turned out. Um, we were just in negotiations for just like under like three weeks. So it was kind of like nice and quick. Uh, a little bit nerve wracking, of course, when you're dealing with such big, big uh, heavy hitters like Dana White and, you know, Mick Maynard and stuff like that. But I'm just happy that we came to uh, agreement and I'm just happy to be back and, uh, you know, fighting for the best organization in the world. When Dana White did, did that one interview, and, I mean, it was a shock to many people stating that we're probably going to be going a different way. Did that actually have the reverse effect, that that actually brought things together, that you, you guys were able to sit down and talk after that interview? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, it's just, um, it's just you know, I kind of, I knew this, it's in a negotiation, you know, and... Uh, and sometimes those are done in public. And sometimes they're done in public, and I've never kind of experienced that before, but, uh, you know... It is what it is. I'm happy the way everything turned out. You know, brought more attention to my name as well. Because um, before those fights, nobody like you know, I'm I'm winning. I'm on a big fight winning streak. I'm beating the guys in UFC. You know, I'm twisting guys' necks and stuff. But nobody's really talking about it. You know, and I kind of like I'll never forget being interviewed uh, only by one person after kind of like dominant performances. You know, at MGM Grand. And it was kind of weird. I'm, I, I, like, I don't understand. Like, you know, I, I remember people, like a certain reporter asking questions towards a fighter who was not even fighting on a card. And I kind of thought, like, this is just, I, I don't understand what's happening here. But going through everything, winning more fights, and then, you know, finishing contract in a proper manner, you know, all four fights, all finishes, um, that kind of brought more attention to my name. And, um, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. Like, I don't care about... You know, getting hyped up or anything. I just care about you know uh, proper finishes and proper performances, and then uh, down the road, all those results they will speak for themselves. Did at any point during those those three weeks that you classified as nerve wracking, did you ever think, man, I, I could use a manager in this situation, or did it reinforce your belief that I want to be at, at the front of these negotiations for myself? Um, it's kind of like there's a lot on my mind, you know. One is just like, I, I know I, I work so hard. I see other fighters, in my opinion, they don't work nearly half as hard as I do. And uh, I kind of don't understand like why I'm in such a position all of a sudden. Meanwhile, I, I'm, I have great performances and all that. But it's just, you know, so many things were going through my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't sure. It's like, oh, how am I going to make more money and where I'm going to go from now on. But, you know, I've been getting some offers from... Um, Organizations in Russia as well for super high level of money. Oh, wow. So I always knew that uh, you know I'm not going to be broke. I'm going to eat good all the time. So that kind of gave me more confidence and um, with the negotiation and just like everything in general. So it just worked out perfect. You know everything worked out like the way. You know if I did it all over again, I think I would do exact same thing all over again. 
One of the fighters that, that put a big spotlight on you, I felt, that weekend in Toronto was Anthony Johnson, who was supposed to be headlining that card, still did come up to Toronto and was just, he was just raving about your performance and your future at 205 pounds. Uh, what did that mean to you? And I would also love to get your reaction because it surprised a lot of people with Anthony Johnson's sudden retirement announcement a few months later. Yeah, you know, Anthony Johnson talking like really highly about me, that kind of like, uh, I kind of, I, I thought that was really, really cool. That was really, really amazing because he's such a high level, elite level fighter himself. Like literally one of the most dangerous guys, just well known, super heavy hitter. And it was really refreshing and amazing to get a, a, a good, a good kind of response from a real fighter. You know, in my opinion, sometimes it means more than getting uh, credit from like a coach or something like that, you know from someone who actually been there, seen it, he knows what's happening. It was really, really nice. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really great, uh, grateful to, uh, for him. He said that, all those things. Nothing, nothing but respect to Anthony Johnson, you know. But having said that, seeing him retire, uh, I think he's a man, you know. He's, uh, first of all, he's one of the most dangerous fighters, period. Not just in the division, but just one of the most dangerous fighters, period. He fought in many different weight classes. He fought so many different fights. He fought so many tough, 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 tough uh, fighters. And, um, you know, his fight record and his knockouts all speak for themselves, you know. And him earning all this money and making big name for himself and then retiring for the sport with thick bank account and with a big name and with... From what I see, zero damage done to him. Um, my hat goes off to him, you know, like he's a man. I, one day I hope to be in a position that he's at, you know. Everyone's like, oh, where are you going to fight again? When are you fight again? He doesn't need to fight, you know. He has everything he needs, you know. All his family, all the highs, houses paid for. Uh, he's a man, you know. I hope every other fighter can uh, achieve and kind of come on uh, that kind of high note that he did, you know. And now he's opening other ventures and other businesses, and he's well-known and well-respected. And, man, amazing. Good job. Congrats. One of, the th one of the reasons he did cite as well was that he just he didn't want to have issues down the road, whether it be brain damage, concussion issues. You've been in gyms your entire life. Have you sensed a, a shift amongst athletes and especially fighters when it comes to that knowledge that's out there because i think the past decade we've seen a philosophical change where some it just used to be you get a concussion you get back in there and you don't treat it with the same kind of severity that i feel you do in 2017 yeah you know concussions and injuries is a very very big and serious issue and um at the end of the day you know you're the one going in the cage so you should be more vocal about everything and if something hurts you or your head hurts or this and that you should listen to yourself you know you should not listen to uh, coaches all these yes men all these whoever it is you know you should listen to yourself and if if that's the issue you you, you feel like you know you've been getting hit or your head hurts or your back hurts or whatever it is i think that uh, you should take all these things into consideration and control yourself protect yourself not a single coach will be able to do that nobody will be able to do that the only person who can do that is you and yourself so um, I think sometimes instead of listening to coaches and yes men it's very important to pay attention to yourself and listen to yourself and that's exactly what Anthony Johnson did and I respect him even more for that you know all these coaches are like, oh, when are you going to fight? Oh, they, they want to push him. They want to push him, you know. And uh, they don't know anything that he went through, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't know how it feels. A lot of these coaches, they never had a single fight in their life, you know. And they talk from the experience. So I don't know how that really works. But, man, congrats to Anthony Johnson once again. He's a man. Thanks to Misha Serkinov, and if you want to hear the entire chat we had last week, part one and part two this week, the full thing is up at youtube.com slash fight network, which is also where you can listen to the MMA report. 
each week if you so choose to do so via YouTube. All right, let's take a quick look at the UFC Fight Night card for this Sunday morning. The Fight Pass portion kicks off at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. It's a big difference from the last time that they were in Sweden back in January of 2015, where it was a Fox card. That was the night Anthony Johnson stopped Alexander Gustafsson, and they aired it in prime time in the U.S., and therefore was taking place in the wee hours of the morning in Sweden. This time they have adjusted it to facilitate the Swedish audience who will be watching it at a normal time of the day uh, and will be an early start on Sunday. I kind of look at look at it as a, uh, a nice welcome change to do a Sunday morning card. I mean, it's not ridiculous. 9 a.m. is a perfectly suitable start time. We got Marcin Held taking on Damer Hodzovic in the fight pass opener and then Darren Till against Jessen Ayari in welterweight action. Uh, Marcin Held certainly came in with a, a bit of steam from Bellator, kind of been cooled off. Um, this could be a, a good performance for him here to kick things off. Then the televised prelims will be airing at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you are in Canada, they'll be on Fight Network, and then the main card is on TSN5. You've got Nico Masoke taking on Bojan Velikovic. Reza Madadi against Joaquim Silva, Chris Camozzi taking on Trevor Smith, and then Pedro Munoz meets Damian Stasiak. Main card at 1 Eastern, Jack Hermanson will be taking on Alex Nicholson. Uh, Oliver Enkamp meets Nordin Taleb, and then Abdul Razak Al-Hassan will be taking on Omari Akhmedov. And the three big fights, you've got Ben Saunders against Peter Sabata. Sabata defeated... Nicholas Dalby in his last outing in September prior to that hadn't fought since UFC 193 where he lost to Kyle Noak. Uh, he's taking on Ben Saunders who has had uh, a number of stints with the company. He had that loss to Patrick Cote last June, then one outside of the UFC, came back and beat Court McGee in January. Uh, 34 years of age is Ben Saunders. I mean, he's always a really fun style of fighter to watch, uh, but Peter Sabata He's made significant improvements throughout his career and quite a different fighter than the version that was fighting for the UFC up until 2010 during his first stint with the company. But this card is really built around the two big light heavyweight fights on the card. Misha Serkinov, our guest earlier, takes on Volkan Uzdemir. Uzdemir came into the UFC. He, he had been fighting at heavyweight has fought at light heavyweight in the past, but had had two heavyweight fights in a row, then came into the UFC fighting at 205 and got a split decision victory over Ovin St. Preux. And this catapulted him in the ratings where he is somehow going into this ahead of Misha Serkinov, who I just, I look in comparison that Serkinov, four wins in the UFC, stoppage victories, and beat Nikita Krylov, who is definitely, uh, you know, a significant light heavyweight win for Misha Serkinov. Um, I like Serkinov in this fight a lot. Um, he will be have, he will have a two inch reach advantage over Uzdemir. And I feel that Serkinov, while he may be pushed in this fight, I feel that, uh, stoppage is probable, but I think, I feel that Serkinov is a pretty safe bet. And as you heard in the interview, he will be ready to fight at the end of July if he is asked to fight Jimmy Manoa. On that card. And this really skyrockets Serkinov with a win over Uzdemir. I think it's actually beneficial that Uzdemir, he's to me not as dangerous an opponent as some of the other light heavyweights above him, but yet he is valued highly in these rankings that it actually will move Serkinov ahead in a weird state of where everything is. But I like Serkinov in this fight. Main event, Alexander Gustafsson against Glover Teixeira. A lot of people were looking at Teixeira going into the Jared Cannonier fight as this is going to be a referendum on Teixeira. He was blown out by Anthony Johnson last August. How is he going to respond? He responded very well. He uh, won by unanimous decision over Cannonier. Looked really good in that fight. From a style perspective, I mean, five rounds you would assume is going to favor Gustafson if this were to go into the fourth or fifth rounds. Teixeira has a really solid tank on him as well. Uh, the odds for this fight, I'm looking at it now. Five Dimes has Gustafson as a minus 330 favorite and Teixeira listed at plus 270. I think that's a big disparity between an ultra close fight. I mean, I would not be that confident on Gustafson. Much younger fighter. 
I mean, if you're scripting this, this returning to Sweden where he suffered one of the worst losses of his career against Anthony Johnson and redeeming himself. I mean, the story writes itself and it writes the ship of Alexander Gustafsson, who unfortunately, like the biggest knock against him is that all of the key contenders and champions he has losses to. He, he had the loss to John Jones, which is, I mean, his, his UFC tenure, they have hung his hat on that performance against John Jones, but then has the loss to Anthony Johnson, the loss to Daniel Cormier. Great fights with Jones and Cormier. Uh, but this is a really important fight for Alexander Gustafson, a loss here. Uh, that, that definitely derails him at 205 pounds. I mean, I, not to say they're similar fighters. But a loss here would put him in kind of the same lingering spot that Aliyah McGeary is in in Bellator where you've just – you're behind the eight ball with so many of these contenders above you at this point and that you have losses to. Uh, nonetheless, I mean this is, a, this is a tough fight to predict. I mean I – I'm going to lean with Gustafson in this fight, but I have a really hard time uh, choosing one over the other here because Glover Teixeira is someone that I have had reservations about in the past. I thought going against Ovin St. Pru that St. Pru was going to have a style that would be very problematic for Teixeira, and it did not. And Teixeira comes up big when you look at who has beaten him in the UFC, and you're looking at Anthony Johnson and John Jones. He's had a remarkable uh, tenure coming to the UFC. 37 years of age. I, I think that that time for Glover Teixeira to truly be excelling in this division, it's there's not a lot of time until that that expiration comes, in my opinion. Will it be this Sunday, though? That's another question. I think this could be a real war. This could be an outstanding fight between these two. I will lean Gustafson, but I, I state that with uh, the ultimate lack of assurance as we head into Sunday's card in Sweden. I really like these top two fights. I think that there should be a fun card, but those are the two fights of substance for this card. And look at light heavyweight. It's a division that is not... It's not the middleweight division. It's not the featherweight division. But there are contenders emerging. There is life to this division that there wasn't a year ago. And regardless of who comes out of the Cormier-Jones rematch, you've got the two winners out of this. You've got Jimmy Manoa. It's a division that at least is showing signs of some momentum, some interest in future fights. I think Serkinov is a big part of that. A 30-year-old Gustafson, 30 years old. You don't think of him as being that young, but uh, someone that, I mean, conceivably, his best years are ahead of him, not behind him. And Gustafson and Serkinov, uh, that's a fight that I feel will happen at some point. And who gets Jimmy Manoa after this? All great questions. Could would Gustafson be willing to fight Jimmy Manoa now? They fought once. He beat him. Would he really see the motivation to fight him a second time, even if that would be on a prominent card, but no title opportunity guaranteed? I mean, that's another interesting issue there because of the All-Stars affiliation. All right. That's going to wrap up the show. Thank you for listening. I want to thank Misha Serkinov and Cody Saftik for joining me. We'll be back next week. We'll chat uh, whatever comes out of this uh, particular fight night card in sweden and next weekend it is ufc 212 from rio de janeiro brazil you've known it's coming in the back of your head but we're almost there to jose aldo and max holloway what a fantastic featherweight championship fight they will unify their two versions of the 145 pound title can all wait for that fight um really looking forward to that card next weekend so we will have lots of ufc 212 coverage coming your way once again, you can uh, grab the show at FightNetwork.com or LiveAudioWrestling.com. Drops every Thursday on both of the iTunes feeds for Live Audio Wrestling and the MMA Report with John Pollock. Subscribe to either. Leave us a review. We would appreciate it. And also goes up at YouTube.com slash Fight Network. That is it for me, and we will speak with you next week.